1990-91 was a sweet season for the Minnesota North Stars, but it couldn't have begun on a more sour note. Early in the year, North Stars owners George and Gordon Gund approached the Metropolitan Sports Commission with an ultimatum. Fifteen million dollars from the community for renovations to Met Center and a commitment from Minnesota guaranteeing the sale of 10,000 season tickets. Otherwise, the team would leave Minnesota and head for supposedly greener pastures in Northern California. Neither the North Stars fans nor the National Hockey League wanted to see professional hockey leave Minnesota, where more Americans grow up playing and watching hockey than in any other state. However, after weeks of heated discussion and uncertainty, the people of Minnesota reacted predictably to the owners' negotiating tactics. Weeks went by, and speculation surrounded the team's future when the owners finally announced a possible sale to a group headed by California filmmaker and former Hartford Whalers owner Howard Baldwin for $31 million. As part of the sale, the NHL allowed the Guns to purchase an expansion franchise in San Jose, California. North Star's general manager Jack Ferreira announced he would accompany the Guns to California. Shortly thereafter, Stars head coach Pierre Paget also announced he was leaving to take the general manager position with the Quebec Nordiques. Once the sale was completed, the new North Stars ownership went right to work to fill these vacancies. One of the first people pursued was former Philadelphia Flyers player and general manager Bobby Clark. Clark, a courageous, feisty, and fiercely competitive center, played 15 years for the Flyers, leading them to a number of divisional championships and two Stanley Cups. After retiring, Clark moved to the front office where he spent six additional years with the Flyers as general manager. On June 8th, Bob Clark became the new North Stars general manager. In the meantime, more turmoil was taking place in the front office. Former Calgary Flames owner and shopping mall magnet Norman Green, a minor shareholder in the Baldwin Ownership Group, acquired the controlling interest of the North Stars by purchasing 51% of the team. And Green stated publicly that the North Stars would continue to call Met Center home rather than move to the new arena downtown. But I can assure you down the road, we're going to have one of these in, in the Twin Cities, and it's going to be ours, and we, we're going to try and keep it for as long as possible. All of this seemed pretty complicated, but it didn't affect new general manager Bob Clark, who only two weeks after he's hired names Bob Ganey as the North Star's new head coach. Ganey, a former captain of the Montreal Canadiens, played 16 seasons with the Canadiens, including eight as team captain. He also played on five Stanley Cup championship teams, winning the Conn Smythe Trophy as the most valuable player in the 1979 playoffs, and was respected throughout the league as a hard-working two-way player, winning the NHL Best Defensive Forward Trophy four years in a row. The adjustment back into the NHL was something that I was very familiar with, uh, and the year that I was away, uh, I realized that I wanted to get back into the NHL and, and be a part of the National Hockey League. I had one or two opportunities at different levels to become involved with different teams. And uh, when I heard from Bob Clark about the coaching position here, uh, I was very interested and uh, it didn't take us very long to consummate a, a, a contract, uh, two or three weeks of uh, talking back and forth between Europe and North America and then uh, a trip over here and uh, I knew it was the place I wanted to come. As Clark and Ganey began formulating plans to remake the hockey side of the business, changes continued to come out of the front office. After less than 40 days as an owner of the North Stars, Howard Baldwin resigned, clearing the way for Norm Green to become the hands-on owner. We're just talking about a couple of executives that have a difference of view, that, that are going to part amicably, and that the bottom line as far as the community is concerned and the team is concerned is that uh, the goals will not uh, vary, and if anything, uh, the emphasis will be even greater on our success. And once he was in full control, it was right to the business at hand, as Green announced that General Manager Bob Clark was in Philadelphia to sign free agent forward Brian Propp. Propp, a five-time All-Star who played ten years with Philadelphia and a year with Boston, brought the North Stars not only a new scoring threat, but the kind of veteran leadership that a rebuilding team needs. Coach Ganey couldn't have been happier. When Brian Propp was added to our team, I thought it was a, a tremendous addition. Uh, for a number of reasons. He was a proven uh, NHL player who had scored uh, regularly in 35 to 40 goal range over a 10-year period. He had moved out of a comfortable place in Philadelphia uh, to uh, 
a Stanley Cup final finish with the Boston Bruins, and he was ready to move on. But the, uh, I, I think the thing that, that made it uh, concrete in my mind was that Brian Propp wanted to come with our team. He expressed uh, an interest in coming with our team, and uh, I knew then that he would be a quality player for us throughout the season. Shortly after Prop joined the North Stars, Clark made another key trade by acquiring former North Stars and Montreal center Bobby Smith. Well, Bobby Smith coming to our team was a similar situation as Brian Prop. I don't think you can get enough good quality people on your team, and Bob certainly exemplifies that. Uh, I knew him well, and I knew what he'd do for our team inside the room and outside the room. Uh, I'm sure there were times early in the year when the players were having difficulty reading me uh, communicating with me when he uh, used his position to bridge that gap and uh, as far as his uh, contribution to the club over the course of the season I think you see a lot of small things that he gave to the team and certain players that were implemented along the way and his great playoff performance one of the leading players on our team soon the new look North Stars were ready for training camp the date was September 7th, and in just a few days, the Stars would be heading for the Soviet Union. To prepare for the trip, Coach Ganey held a third day of practice at 5 a.m. so the team would be ready to cross nine time zones. The trip turned out to be rough on the ice as well as off it. Well, the trip to the Soviet Union was uh, definitely, uh, it's tiring. I mean, it's a long flight over there. The accommodations aren't that great. And uh, like I said, I mean, you still get the ice, but you, you don't get a chance to work on a weights. There was no weight facilities around there to, to work out on. Um, the food isn't all that great. You hear a lot of things with the shortages of, you know, food, of, of merchandise and everything, and everybody's standing in long lineups. I mean, three blocks from McDonald's. I mean, at home, if we have to wait 10 minutes at McDonald's, we're, we're disturbed. It was type of a, a tough situation, I think, for everybody. You're trying to to get ready for the upcoming season and you know the surroundings were perfect and you're eating food that you normally wouldn't eat and uh, it was tough but uh, you know personally I knew what the, what I had to do during the summer to get myself ready. After 10 long days in the Soviet Union the Stars returned home with a 1-3 and three record and little progress made in helping the new players and coaching staff adjust to each other. In the meantime, owner Norm Green was working to renegotiate the devastating agreement that Howard Baldwin made with the Guns to send up to 30 North Stars players to the Guns' San Jose expansion team. We only had 24 players there playing, so I phoned John Ziegler afterwards. I said, John, the, uh, here's the article that says 30 of our players are going to San Jose. We only had 24. I need to buy six more players to fill up the roster. The most important thing we wanted to do was to be able to talk. And once we were able to talk under the auspices of Bill Wirtz and, and uh, Cliff Fletcher and Paul Martha, uh, we were able to do things for them, and they were able to do things for us. And we ended up f phenomenal. We ended up uh, losing a very few, player, very few players, and through the expansion draft, ended up to be a stronger team next year. As the Stars prepared for the regular season, problems continued to mount as defenseman Mark Tenorti is suspended for the first 10 games of the season for leaving the penalty box to fight Chicago's Chris Chelios in a preseason game. Tenorti recalls the incident. It's still a high-intensity game, whether it's uh, preseason, uh, regular season, or playoffs. I lost my cool a bit there, and that uh, set me back. When it was finally time for the season to start, all of the off-season turmoil came home to roost, as only 5,700 fans show up to see the Stars lose 3-2 to two to the St. Louis Blues. Still, Norm Green remained upbeat and optimistic. I was uh, uh, shocked. Uh, but I was still focused. I felt that if we just kept hammering away, kept on doing the right things, kept uh, showing the public that we were hands-on, that we cared, that we had a line of communication with the fans. I talked to a lot of fans, as many as I could, to get a feeling of why this was not successful, because it didn't make sense to me that, for it not to be. I learned a lot. Um, I, I made some mistakes. I, I took some advice as far as what people were, were looking for. We, we ended up by doing some discounting and some giveaways. A few days later, management saw a glimmer of hope as 9,129 fans show up to watch the Stars battle Chicago. We ended up having uh, a biggest, our biggest game was against Chicago on a Saturday night. 9,000 people. 9,000 people for Chicago on a Saturday night is really terrible. But compared to 4,000 or 5,000 on the opening, it was fantastic. So we get a little bit of encouragement there. There were very, very few signs of encouragement other than 
our uh, confidence to know that if we just kept on running this business properly and everybody else in the National Hockey League was, was healthy and that there's no way in the world that hockey shouldn't be able to be successful at, uh, in, in Minnesota. But as the first part of the season trudged on, the North Star's losses mounted, and the fans, disgusted with the off-season chaos and the team's on-ice performance, stayed away in droves. The lowest point maybe wasn't on the ice, but I think it was just the, the fan support, the three, four, five thousand fans, and I, you know, was, I think, pretty disappointing for most of the players. We really felt that we could accomplish something throughout the season. We got behind the eight ball a little bit, we got off to a slow start, uh, so that set us back in the standings a little bit, but we never really got blown out of any games. We were never really um, not in games. We, uh, we were competitive all the way through. Those 4-2, um, 4-3 four, four, losses just turned into 4-2, four, 4-3 four, wins for us later on in the season. It was evident the North Stars had to make more changes, so General Manager Bobby Clark picks up strong defenseman Brian Glynn in a trade with Calgary. Finally, after going 0-7-1 on the road, the North Stars win their first game against Quebec, generally regarded as the worst team in the league. But a win's a win, and the Stars use the victory to build on while offering a glimpse into the future by playing hard and forging a tie against a tough Canadian team in Gainey's coaching debut at Montreal. Well, going back into the Montreal Forum was a special night for me. I had been away from uh, the Montreal organization for a little over a year, but uh, and even now very close to many of the people who still work there with their team. Uh, during 16 years there, I had the opportunity to have good nights and bad nights and good seasons and bad seasons. And I think the people in Montreal, they understand and they, uh, they enjoyed the style of play that I had and the work effort that I gave them. And, they gave me a great ovation. It was, uh, it was a touching night. It was a great night. Still, the fans were slow to return to Met Center. So the team instigated new promotional gimmicks, like the Star Stakes and Lucky Stars cash giveaways. The fans showed only a slight interest in these new ideas. And the theory was that once people came to the game, at that point for money, but saw the team, saw that we were permanent, saw that we were trying, that they would come back. Well, uh, it worked a little bit, but as soon as we stopped it, those guys never came back again, because it turns out that they just came to win the, the money. The press wasn't helping much either, as Sports Illustrated came out with an article about the demise of the North Stars. But even in the article, Green remained positive. Nobody ever said to me, what are you doing here? This is dumb. This is, there's no way you're going to make this. Not a soul. So, and not a soul in the building. Outside the building, <laughs> there are people that, 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 that said that quite often, and a lot of people in the press said that quite often. But, uh, but our fans, the guy that paid when things were bad, paid when things were bad, told me, uh, Norm, thank you, and stay with it. It'll be good. God, that was the most encouraging uh, among some many dis discouraging signs. After missing two games due to his wife's surgery, Ganey returned to the North Stars bench and the Stars clobber the Flyers 7-zip to go undefeated in their last four games. Three days later, the Stars pick up Minnesota natives Jim Johnson and Chris Dahlquist because the team needed more physical players. The new additions pay off immediately when the Stars beat the Blackhawks in their next game as Johnson says hello to Chicago center Jeremy Roenick. Though the stars are playing better, the fans in Minnesota remain unconvinced. Attendance continues to lag, and the stars mercifully announce the end of their star stakes promotion. Norm Green, not one to give up, puzzles over what to do as he made his game day strolls through the Met, talking to the fans about what they want to see from this hockey team. By now, it's the All-Star break, and Dave Gagne and Bobby Smith are named to the team. And Gagne, who almost quit last season after a frustrating time trying to make it to the NHL, gets his first All-Star goal. You know, that was probably the most nervous I'd been in a hockey game in a long time. Uh, there was a lot of uh, attention focused around the All-Star game, and I was, um, you know, kind of, kind of nervous and, and wanted things to go well. And being around all the best players in the game at the time, I never really considered myself, uh, you know, in that category. So it was really a special day for me and. Uh, to score the opening goal of the game was uh, 
was just like a dream come true. Despite a few solid games, including a surprising 7-3 win over St. Louis, Norm Green decides to light a fire under everyone in the organization after a lackluster 4-0 loss to Toronto. And then we went in Toronto and lost 4-0. Um, I watched the game on tape a couple of times and didn't think that our team worked hard. To me, that was worse than 4,000 people at a game because with a hard-working team, we can build. With a, without a hard-working team, you got nothing. So emotionally, which I, don't, I, don't, I guess I do once in a while, but, but I don't do it on the, on the hockey level because that's Bob Clark's department. But I went to Bob and I said, Bob, uh, if we can't communicate to the public that we are hard-working, we've got nothing. We won't make this. Do what you have to do to make sure that the boys, we only have hardworking guys here. And if there's somebody here, I don't care how good a talent he is, that isn't a hardworking guy and doesn't communicate that he's a hardworking guy, then from my viewpoint, I'd really rather you didn't have him. We have to sell hard work. The team also stepped up their efforts to reach out to fans throughout the state. The team's new vice president of communications, Pat Forcia, explains the new direction. The team had to win people back one by one, and I think everybody in our entire organization, from Norm to our Zamboni driver to the ushers to Dave Gagne to Bob Ganey, everybody understood that, and that's the attitude that, that we all took. We, uh, from the front office point of view, we need to do all that we can to make sure that the three hours that people spend with us is, is the funnest three hours they have. The entire organization recommitted itself to work harder than ever before. And Norm Green takes that message to the fans in a new television commercial. Hi, I'm Norman Green, and I'm here to tell you the North Stars have made some changes. Our players are working harder. Our ushers are working harder. Our cleaning crew is working harder. Even our Zamboni driver is working harder. Everybody here is working harder to make North Stars hockey great. Order a pair of 91-92 season tickets and we'll give you one more free. Plus, free tickets to this season's remaining home games. Just call 853-9420. At about the same time, the front office was getting their act together. The team was starting to work harder on the ice as well. From mid-January through the end of the regular season, the Stars went 12-2-2 at Met Center with a number of impressive victories and a 13-game unbeaten streak at home. And as the team began to work harder, you could see the great improvement in their individual performances. Nothing was getting by goalkeeper John Casey. Left wing Brian Bellows continued to shine. Mike Modano showed the skating ability of a future superstar. Left in the center zone. Hips coming into the box. Oh, yeah! He goes right yeah. And Dave Gagne kept tallying up the goal. Left wing Brian Pop added the clutch veteran play he was acquired to provide. And Mark Tenorti came into his own as a threatening two-way defenseman. And when it came to hitting, the stars were pretty tough with Kirk Giles. Jim Johnson. On out to center the two -line pass. Oh, and... Chris Dahlquist. Get out to center, Brent Nemore, into the North Star zone, and he got flattened on a high, hard kick. Oh, Dahlquist, flattened with the shoulder up high. And who could forget bump and thump? Basil McRae. But this time it's Shane Churla getting a free. And Shane Churla. Pat Murphy, and does he handle it? Storm out of ice time here tonight. Complementing this physical play was a newfound emphasis on speed as the Stars won shootouts against powerhouses like Edmonton and Calgary. Once again, the team hit the airwaves to talk to their fans. North Stars hockey, take one. Here they come, here they come, they're playing. Come on, right, come on, relax, move the camera. Oh, left, left, left. These guys are fast. Hey, come on now, come on. What a save. Did you get it? Than I remember. I don't know. What do you mean you don't know? I'm here. All right, now, come on, come on. Get number four here. Yeah, number yeah, four. I got him, I got him, I got him. Oh, Order a pair.
pair of 9192 season tickets and we'll give you one more free. As the winds started mounting, so did the crowds, with the first sellout of the year coming in the last home game against the first place Blackhawks. The stars had rediscovered the lightning in their skates, and the fans were beginning to provide the thunder in the stands that would carry the team to unexpected heights. Since the stars snuck into the playoffs with the second worst record in the league, everyone knew it was going to be a long road. But when they drew the league-leading Chicago Blackhawks in the first round, they knew it was going to be a rough road as well. The Blackhawks were known around the league as a hard-hitting, nasty team that would beat you any and every way they could. And their hometown fans could be ruthless, making Chicago Stadium one of the toughest places to win in the NHL. The players knew what to expect from Chicago. They've always played with a lot of intensity, and they're, they've always been a hard-working team, and I don't think you saw anything different in the playoffs from them. They pretty much had the same teams they did a year ago, so we knew what to expect from Chicago, and I think the fuel that was added to the fire was a comment made by uh, the Chicago coaching staff where you know they were talking about the Stanley Cup and that they didn't want it to happen this year what happened the previous year, and that was to go seven games against Minnesota. They wanted to make it short and sweet and, and move on to you know bigger and better things. So that was the fuel on the fire that I think it really got most of the players. Game one at Chicago was everything the North Stars expected. A physical game filled with penalties. Chicago scored late in the game, descended into overtime. And after a penalty on Chicago, Brian Propp scored on a rebound of Mark Tenorti's shot. Chicago came back to tie the series with a 5-2 victory in game two. And then it was back to Met Center for game three and the most controversial play of the series. The North Stars struck early and jumped out to a 5-2 lead in the first period. Listen to this crowd! But Chicago battled back to tie the score. Then came the controversial goal. Late in the game, Chicago's Jeremy Roenick fired a shot from 25 feet. The goal was counted, but the Stars claimed that Blackhawks forward Mike Hudson illegally interfered with Stars goaltender John Casey. And there is no question about oh, this. You can't allow that goal, Mr. Morales. The goal was ruled good, but the next day, the NHL supervisor of officials said the winning goal should have been disallowed. The referee made a mistake or missed a call, and it cost us a chance to win the game. It wouldn't have given us the game. Uh, uh, we brought it to the attention of the supervisors and uh, and they were in agreement with us that the goal, if it had been called correctly, would not have counted. Game four was the most bitterly fought yet, with 139 minutes in penalties and two Blackhawk players ejected. And over in the corner to the right of the Hawks It's a game Basil McRae will never forget. It was a situation where we were ahead and uh, Chicago, I think, tried to... Uh, um, change momentum not just of that game but of the series by trying to get physical I don't know whether they were frustrated or whether it was a game plan of you know Mike Keenan's but um, there was an altercation where uh, it, it was probably one of the toughest things for me to do and that was not to get involved you know in a fight and uh, um, you know so many times you see it during the playoffs you know a lot of times the calls by the officiating are, are determined by the score and with us being ahead uh, for me to get involved in an altercation uh, there was a good chance that we were going to come up on the short end of the stick. The start of the fourth game, what I remember most, is we almost had a brawl at the uh, start of the warm-up there. Guys were lined up around center ice. I remember Baz was in the middle of it, and Tenorti came in at Churla, and then uh, I remember I was there yapping to of third Graham, and finally things got split up a little bit, and we're sitting there along the penalty box, and Dirk Graham's talking to Wally Harris, and I came over, and Dirk was saying how, you know, the North Stars had, you know, tried to instigate this brawl and I was telling him no Wally Harris the director of refereeing there that it was uh, the, the Hawks and then I remember Dirk saying to me he says it doesn't matter what you guys do you're never going to win this series Brian and uh, to me I, I remember that sticks out so much in my mind because I said I, you know Dirk tell you what I don't think you guys will win another game here and uh, it ended up being true because our team just we ended up winning the, the next three games Center. Ronick loses to Broughton the Stars took advantage of Blackhawk tempers for a 3-1 to one victory. The series is now 2-2 two two and headed back to Chicago. Once they take the ice in Chicago, the Stars score early and often to stun the sellout crowd and annihilate the obviously frustrated Blackhawks 6 to nothing. We usually uh, 
didn't have very good games in Chicago. And it was, it's probably the most challenging rink to play and, and to, uh, to win by that, uh, you know, uh, large of a score was, was a big boost in confidence to us. And I think that was probably the pivotal game in our, us turning the corner and uh, gaining confidence and believing in ourselves for the rest of the playoffs. The scene shifted to Met Center. Game six was a hard-fought battle. But the physical play of the North Stars and the sellout crowd was too much for the Blackhawks, as the Stars sent them packing with a 3-1 to one upset. Bob Ganey credited the victory to his team's discipline. We had to find a way to beat their pressure game, and that was with quick puck movement and good positional play by our players. Uh, we also had to take advantage of their flagrant uh, misuse of the rules. Uh, they would use the rules to their advantage, trying to intimidate at times, trying to push the rules to the limit. Uh, our power play was outstanding during the series, and uh, if there was one point that, that you can look at and say, why did we beat Chicago, it was because of our power play. I think the fact that we had a lot of power plays helped our team last year in the playoffs, and you know, according to what Mike Keenan said, that we had too many in the playoffs, playoffs you have to look back and figure out that you know, why did we? Was it because that uh, other teams were taking dumb penalties or was it because we were a very disciplined team and because we were beating teams that we weren't supposed to, as according to other people, maybe they were getting a little upset. Maybe the other teams were just couldn't handle the fact that Minnesota North Stars were beating them. And because of that, I, I think you saw, you know, a rash of penalties at certain times, especially in our building when we had uh, blown out some teams. You know, we're up three or four goals going into the third period. So... The fact that we had 152 power plays in the, in the playoffs is probably a, more of a, a tribute to our team playing so disciplined and playing so well. In eliminating the hated Blackhawks, the Stars had defeated the number one team in the league. But an equally formidable opponent lurked nearby. The number two team, the St. Louis Blues, led by Brett Hull, hockey's Mr. Everything. A guy who sends shivers down an opposing goalkeeper's spine every time he touches the puck. But Bob Ganey had a plan for containing Hull. Brett Hull was the leader of their team uh, offensively throughout the season. Uh, all through the season, we had close games with St. Louis, and there wasn't any, any time during the year, even early, where we didn't feel that we could beat St. Louis. I had followed St. Louis closely, and I knew that Brett Hull had never been shadowed before. He hadn't had that kind of coverage. Uh, when we took his prolific goal scoring away from their team, they became a team that we could handle and that we could adjust to and we could move with. Well, in the St. Louis series, we, we felt that we had to really be tight with Brett Hull. Um, Gaetan Deshane and myself uh, primarily would go out and uh, whenever he was on the ice, be within a stick length uh, away from him, always be in contact with him uh, just about wherever he went. And uh, just to eliminate, their team tries to get him the puck and he's the one that can score it, uh, in, a, in a split second. And so we wanted to try to be real close and, and deny him getting the puck. Throughout the series, Gavin and Duchesne were inside Hull's uniform. This kind of defensive pressure helped the Stars to a 2-1 to victory in Game 1. After losing the second game, the Stars went back to the Met for two big victories, 5-1 to in Game 3 and an 8-4 to demolishment in Game 4. By this time, the momentum was really picking up at Met Center. It's fun! Actually, we just bought six season tickets tonight. A close-fought 4-2 loss in St. Louis prolonged the series, but the Stars returned home with a one-game edge, looking to clinch their first Norris Division championship since 1984. Obviously, the coaching staff was ready for this big matchup, and the players had a way of getting ready as well. But we used to go for the from a ritual in the room before going out to be Basil and Charles and. Um, myself at the door and uh, there'd be a, you know if you pat the guy in the shoulder or hit the guy in the helmet or you bang sticks or bang knees and it was always the same thing there's probably about six or seven guys that would would do it uh, and the goalies would go first and a few guys in between but the last few guys would be uh, the ones you'd say a couple of words like uh, um, uh, you know the defense are great or whatever it might might be or you know the actually the defense would be the Bruise Brothers I used to nickname them the Bruise Brothers Jimmy Johnson and Chris Delquist and um, they'd go out at the end and just little things, each give each other a tap on the left shoulder back and forth, Baz and I, and going down the aisleway, they'd always pat me and hit me in the rear and hit me in the shoulders and the head once with a stick. And uh, it was just something that you did and you were so scared because things were going, going so well that uh, you wanted to keep doing it. 
Game six was a classic nail biter, with the stars finally prevailing three to two to become Norris Division champs. Bobby Smith will never forget what it was like to win the Norris Division championship at home in front of a sellout crowd. I think it was a tremendous feeling for me and for all the players to eliminate the two teams that we had been looking at with uh, starry eyes all year long. Chicago and St. Louis uh, beat up on us uh, in a pretty good fashion over the course of the regular season. But when it came down to playing both those teams nose to nose, we proved we were the better team. And it was uh, an incredibly satisfying feeling. And it was also another step towards our eventual goal, the Stanley Cup. Now the North Stars were on a roll, and it wasn't just the team. Stars tickets were the hottest ticket in town, and it seemed everyone joined in on the fun, except a no-nonsense Bob Ganey. The shame slides it to Smith. He shoots. He scores! Bobby Smith from the Duke makes it 3 nothing. He shoots. He scores! Bobby Smith from the Duke makes it 3 nothing. North Stars. And oh, did Smith put a move on Chelios before launching that rocket? It's Bobby's first goal in the playoffs and gives the North Stars a commanding lead. Order a pair of 91-92 season tickets and we'll give you one more free. Minnesota is, is, a, is a really good hockey state. It's probably the best state in the United States for hockey at the amateur level. And um, There's a lot of hockey fans, but they're, they're, they know their game and they're, and they're critical and they want, they know when you're not putting out. And I think that uh, once we started to succeed a little bit, they, they, they saw a little, a little bit of a different image in our team and they wanted to come out and support us. When we started winning and started getting those bigger, noisier crowds, it only caught fire. And... Uh, as anybody knows who's played a sport or anybody's involved in, a, in something like this, uh, there's nothing better than playing in front of a full house. There's absolutely nothing better than coming out and hearing the people go crazy. There's, uh, it, it's hard to explain because uh, until you felt it uh, one way with the screaming crowds, the full crowds, um, and you've seen it where it's been empty, it's been five, 6,000 people, you've gone from one extreme to another, it's hard to explain the difference because it's, it's a great feeling. It's so much easier to get up emotionally. And I think when your emotions are high, uh, you don't think about being tired. As the Stars prepared for the Campbell Conference Championship Series with the defending Stanley Cup champion Edmonton Oilers, the focus was on two goalies. Edmonton's Grant Fuhrer, often called the greatest goalie in the world, and the red-hot John Casey. Until now, the Stars had been able to surprise their opponents and grab a victory in the first game. But Edmonton was a city with a winning hockey tradition, and nobody was going to sneak anything away from the Oilers. Edmonton jumped out to an early lead, scoring just two minutes into game one. But the Stars came firing back. Rotten shot, and that ricocheted in front, they score! Gagne! And Mighty Casey slammed the door on the Oilers again and again preserving a 3-1 Stars win. Holding true to their pattern so far, the Stars were flat in Game 2 and took it on the chin 7-2. Then, it was back to the crazed confines of the Met, where the Stars came out on fire to win their sixth straight home playoff game with a decisive 7-3 victory. The Stars stayed hot in Game 4 and jumped all over Fuhr early to bury the Oilers 5-1. Stuart Gavin remembers what it was like to hold a high-powered offense like Edmonton's in check. We had found out in the previous two series that a lot of our success was coming on uh, specialty teams. We were frustrating other teams with real tight checking, uh, and that was everyone on the whole team taking the man and trying to frustrate their players, whether it be uh, right from the, their top player to their player that only had played on the fourth line, say. And I think that uh, the, the style was a game we were trying to keep it tight, um, and uh, frustrate them and our power play had worked uh, really well in the first two series and it continued to work really well against Edmonton and we wanted to uh, try to capitalize on that and plus uh, I just denied them any scoring chances so we waited for our chances and just tried to frustrate them and, and it worked well. The Stars took the final game at Edmonton with a 3-2 to two victory. Veteran Bobby Smith describes his game-winning goal in Game 5. The Oilers had just tied the game 2-2. They had lots of momentum and their fans were really into the game. Right after that, Chris Dahlquist and Stuart Gavin teamed up to get me a scoring chance. Fortunately, I was able to beat Fuhr one-on-one. -on -one. We had the lead, and even though 15 minutes remained in the game, we felt our chances to win were outstanding. The Stars returned to Minnesota as newly crowned Campbell Conference champions, entering their first Stanley Cup Finals since 1981 against another Cinderella finalist, the Pittsburgh Penguins.
The showdown was set. The Stars versus the Pittsburgh Penguins. The first Stanley Cup final in 57 years between two teams who had never won a cup. And the first in a decade between two American teams. Pittsburgh was certain to be a tough opponent with a multifaceted, high-powered offense featuring the likes of Paul Coffey, Mark Recchi, Kevin Stevens, and especially Mario Lemieux, players the Stars had a lot of respect for. You know, we, we had a game plan against Mario Lemieux, realizing that you know, if, if he's not the elite player in the league, he's in the top you know, two or three. So um, We really wanted to concentrate on, uh, you know, of, of course, being tough on Mario Lemieux, but also playing the other four guys tough because you know if we all sort of try and take Mary Lemieux like two or three guys and that's when he's most dangerous he sets up his you know his wingers and uh, you know all four guys in the ice he, you know he's got great you know great view of the ice and uh, I think that was our biggest concern about not only his ability to score but to set up other players. Lemieux's assets are you know his uh, great sense um, for the ice uh, his reach which uh, gets him a lot of loose pucks and uh, he's got a great shot. He's he's aware of what's going on in the ice, and um, he knows where players are. He's got great hockey sense, and he's good around the net. He's a good passer. He's uh, he's a great hockey player. Paul Coffey, however, was questionable because of a broken jaw. But with his skating and scoring ability, the Stars knew they had to be prepared. Paul Coffey is a great great player offensively, and he can and and def uh, defensively. Um, you know, we felt that he uh, was a spark plug to their team, but we also knew that he had been hurt and hadn't played that long, and he was supposed to be weak, uh, um, um, lost quite a bit of weight. He played primarily on the power play and uh, saw sporadic duty. But we, uh, when he was out there, you know, he had to pay it with his skating speed. He can take it from end to end. He's an exciting player to watch, but, uh, you know, we weren't there to watch him either. We wanted to make sure that he didn't get going and do any damage. The Penguins were coached by Minnesota native Bob Johnson, a professor of the game who started his coaching career at Minneapolis Roosevelt High School, spent many years at the University of Wisconsin, and also coached the Calgary Flames. The Stars were confident going into Game 1 at Pittsburgh. North Star veterans Neil Broughton and Bobby Smith turned back the clock and turned a 3-3 tie into the go-ahead and winning goals in a thrilling victory. Smith remembers getting that early lead in the series. It was a great feeling to win the first game in Pittsburgh. We had uh, had great success in our previous three series by stealing the first game in the other team's rink. And the guys were uh, very intent on going out in game two and uh, trying to get a 2 nothing lead because we thought that going back home with that kind of an advantage would really put us in the driver's seat. But even winning game one, we felt very good about our chances of winning the series. On to game two as the Stars pledged to break their string of second game losses. Unfortunately, after tying a cup record with 32 power play goals in three series, the power play short circuits, going one for 14 in the first two Pittsburgh games, and they come up short in a 4-1 to one loss. Game three was back in Minnesota, and much to the surprise of the fans and the team, Mario Lemieux was not in the lineup because of a back problem. The Stars took advantage of the situation, and game three goes to the Stars with a 3-1 to one victory. As the fans filed into Met Center seeking the inevitable Game 4 victory, things took a nasty turn for the worse. Pittsburgh scores the fastest three goals in Cup history, and the Stars trail by three before many of the fans are in their seats. Despite a valiant comeback, the Stars fall 5-3. to three. A loss that really hurt for Coach Ganey and his hard-working players. Things had gone along pretty well all during the playoffs, and, you know, against Chicago we lost two games in a row, but that was the only time we lost two games in a row, so... We always, uh, you know, if we lost one game, we'd come back and win the next game. And we never really got ourselves in a situation or in a losing streak. And, um, you know, once we lost that, uh, the second game, it tied it up. I think that we started second-guessing ourselves. And uh, um, maybe, you know, I think, you know, for years to come, we'll still, you know, try and figure out what happened because it just seemed to, you know, not just slip away from us, but, you know, the bottom went right out of the rink. I think the big thing in that series against the Pittsburgh series is that we were like the reciprocal of what uh, the teams we'd uh, beaten in the, in the beat in the past and that was uh, we took penalties and and we seemed to get frustrated we seemed to focus uh, somewhat on the officiating and um, you know we uh, things didn't go our way uh, against Pittsburgh uh, the way we they had in the previous three rounds and, and it got frustrated but we always did feel uh, uh, up to the last game and even uh, into the last game that we could come back and win.
The next game, the Stars start almost as slow as the team gives up four goals in the first 13 minutes. Once again, a dramatic Stars comeback fell short as the Penguins win 6-4. Hopes were high at Met Center for Game 6, but a battered and tired North Stars team seemed to finally run out of magic as the Penguins shocked the sellout crowd into submission with an 8-0 victory, carrying away hopes of thousands of Minnesota hockey fans along with the Stanley Cup. The North Stars' mission to bring the Stanley Cup to Minnesota fell just short this season. But their accomplishments in just one year cannot be overlooked. Through hard work and perseverance, an overachieving bunch of players and coaches rescued the franchise from hockey's scrap heap and took Minnesota's hockey fans on a roller coaster ride filled with fun that we'll never forget. And by working harder than ever, the Stars will be back, tougher than ever, next year. We're not in salvaging, we're not in desperation, we're not in trying to save, we're not in trying to rebuild. All we're trying to do now is that we're okay and we're building for the future. We're going to go in as tough and as hungry as ever next year. The only pre prediction for next year is, uh, you know, the, I know the guys are going to go in wanting that cup more than they wanted it this year. I think there's, uh, there's a great pride on our team right now and it'll show through again next year. I think there's no reason if we all believe in that we can do it and work towards a common goal that we can be there again and hopefully this time win.